So with that, let me introduce uh, all of you to uh, Pankaj Mishra, who is our session. Good evening, Pankaj. Hope you're doing well. Good evening, Professor Sai. Yes, all good. And Jyotish, uh, I hope you're doing well today. Uh, yes, Satish, like this is good. Yep. Super. So Pankaj uh, is uh, working currently as a data management specialist with uh, Telstra India. Uh, but he started his product management journey, journey around 2007, working on companies like On Mobile Data, uh, Daily Hunt. Uh, it's one of my favorite apps, uh, Pankaj. Uh, I think they've done an incredible job providing localized content, uh, especially news feeds. And I know you worked on the news application uh, before, uh, very disruptive. Congratulations on that. Um, I also you. worked in companies like British Telecom, uh, Sony Technologies, um, and uh, worked on some very interesting products uh, like ring back tones. Now that uh, brings back memories, I must say. Okay. Uh, yeah, and, definitely. Right. Uh, I know um, in the early days of uh, you, know, te you know cell phones and uh, telecommunications companies trying to offer value added services. Correct. Of course, that was a, a highly popular one. The other highly popular one that I that surprised me actually, and I worked in telecom for a long time, was a, a Spider-Man wallpaper. Right, um, the, a telecom company apparently charged fifty rupees for a Spider-Man wallpaper. Right. Time, right. So anyway, I think we've come a long way. Um, and interesting that you also worked in um, developing the ultra rugged mobile phones, right? Especially That's for right. the first responder services like police and fire and emergency services. Uh, I've seen a, a rugged laptop, but I haven't seen a rugged phone though. That must be interesting. Uh, it's like a brick, I suppose. Right? Yeah, they were like half a kg. Uh, you put uh, it into their pocket, and you cannot walk in. Actually, <laughs> that's true. Not to be not to be kept in pocket. Yeah. Right? Um, so Pankaj is also a wildlife enthusiast. Uh, is a member of NASCOM Product Skills Chapter, and of course uh, an IPL alumni at the Executive MBA in Product Leadership. Welcome again, Pankaj, and uh, over to you so that you can introduce Jyotish and then we can get forward. Yeah, all right. Thank you so much, Professor Sai, for the nice words. Um, and good evening, everyone. Um, hi, Pankaj Mishra, um, host for this session. And again, I'll warm welcome you, everyone, on this Product Leadership Festival. Uh, this year, we have already uh, touched upon the topics like uh, product marketing, product storytelling, and some fascinating go-to-market strategies around the world. And carrying on the same momentum around product positioning, we will be touching upon the concept of disruptive product positioning today. I know it may sound complicated to many of you. Well, it was for me initially. Um, so before we get started on a conversation with our special guest today, um, I would like to understand from all of you, what is your understanding about disruptive product positioning? So we are putting a poll on your screen. And I request of each one of you to respond to that poll, please. Sometimes we'll if, you could, if you could read the poll questions for the people on other channels who may not be able to take the poll, at least they can respond. Yeah, sure. Yeah, yeah sure. Um, so the question is, what is disruptive product positioning? Um, and the choices are turning all the market rules upside down, shaking things up, changing the industry as a whole, or all of the above. I hope we are getting some answers on that. Yeah, I think, uh, you know, wait for 30 seconds and you will see the results. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, so poll results are with me. And then uh, thank you so much. Uh, most of them have uh, chosen all of the work. Um, so that's right. So basically, disruptions means doing things unconventionally. What people are doing and you do something different. You challenge the status quo, and that is what is the uh, is the disruption. Now, how companies are creating this disruption? I personally have a um, have an example for this, and I relate to that is the mattress industry in India. So, this industry is more likely to put you to sleep rather than fill you with the excitement. The companies in this space prefer to play it safe and keep their innovations low key. But when a disruptive brands like Wakefit came into the mix the things has changed drastically. So Wakefit disrupted with the technology here by introducing memory foam and orthopedic mattresses and made their packaging so innovative that these huge mattresses could be shrink, transported easily across the geographies. Now next come is back in 2016, nobody has ever thought about it, that you can buy a mattress online. 
Now that is what BakeFit does. They have designed a direct to consumer model, which means that client can buy the mattress online, use it for 100 days. And if you don't like it, you can return it. Then no one has ever th thought about it before that after using 100 days, you can actually return a mattress. And they didn't stop it here, actually. They did a very uh, unique awareness campaign around the product and they have introduced Kumbhkaran. Yes, you have heard it right. They introduced Kumbhkaran as their brand ambassador to convince the, the customer that the biggest sleep influencer in the world has approved wake fit mattresses. And they have created a LinkedIn profile with Kumbhkaran officially and gave him a designation as chief sleeping officer. And the founders and the department heads get engaged with that profile. Now that's hilarious. And this is the kind of thing has made so much disruption that the Indian sleep industry goes sleepless with the brands like Wakefit. Now Wakefit is just one of the example. Uh, and then we could talk about more on the disrupting marketing. But without taking any more time, I would like to introduce our guest speaker for today, Mr. Jyotis Jayan. Jyotis is a successful product marketing leader. Uh, hi, Jyotis. Hi, Pangaj. Yeah, hi. Okay. Uh, good to see you uh, today. And again, um, a very warm welcome on this session. Uh, Jyotis has played key roles in creating multiple successful unicorn stories in the enterprise SaaS world. Uh, he's a specialist in disruptive positioning strategies. Uh, he's an MBA from the University of Bordeaux, France, and a postgraduate in marketing from Great Lakes Institute of Management, Chennai. He's a certified uh, people leader from Indian Institute of Management, Bangalore, and a certified product management expert from Indian School of Business, Hyderabad. I think he has touched every institute uh, uh, from the management in, in India, at least. Uh, Jyotis has worked with so many different organizations in product marketing, and he's currently working as a director of product marketing in Lena.ai, uh, where they are transforming employee experience with the, uh, with the AI. Uh, he hails from Kochi, Kerala, and right now is based out of Hyderabad. He loves cycling and occasionally keen can be seen with his cruiser bike on southern highways and hilltops. Uh, but I think right now on weekends, he's mostly cruising in his car between Hyderabad and Cochin highways. Uh, now I would like to hand over the baton to Jyotish uh, to share his insight on disruptive product positioning for successful story building. Uh, over to you, Jyotish. Uh, thanks, Pangaj. I hope I'm audible clearly. Yep, you are. Yes, uh, thanks for the, the awesome introduction. I mean, that's more than what I actually do. Yeah, that's good. So let me try to share my screen. Yeah, so the topic for today is disruptive product positioning for successful story building. Uh, it sounds a little complicated, but um, I'll try to simplify it on the way. Uh, so I'll just uh, introduce myself. I think the introduction has been done better than like say what I put here. So. Uh, yeah, so I'm Jodish, so I like to like share some insights on the new new age positioning and disruptive strategies. Uh, so and like I say, I've been in product marketing since like last seven or eight years. I've been lucky in that sense, like be part of product marketing function since the start of that trend in India, at least. Uh, the idea of this uh, session and uh, is to like provide the product leaders, so then the future product leaders with the right story building mindset. And I'll come to what story building is later. Uh, the idea is to make sure the right product uh, building, uh, the story building mindset contributes to the success of the products and to create a sustainable impact in the market. That's what I intend to do with this session. And I'll go to the agenda here. Uh, so if you see my, uh, the agenda here, like say, the idea is to like understand the importance of why the right stories are required for your products as the product marketing leaders of the future. Uh, it's important that not just developing the right products, but also make sure it's marketed in the right way. And to also understand why positioning is most important for product leaders. Uh, so that's the second part of it. Uh, so also want to go a little bit into the basics of product positioning. Uh, so, and like, what I have seen over the last seven years that like the traditional way of doing product positioning, but it has that over the years have changed a lot and there are a lot of disruptive ways to do, go about it. And I've personally done a few part of it. So I want to share some insights from my personal journey in this. 
and also share a few real world examples from uh, from the uh, from my own experiences. And like say, we'll take the Q and A after that. So that's the kind of agenda we have. Yeah. So uh, building the right stories uh, is what one part of the uh, the topic is. So I like to focus on the difference between storytelling and story building. So if you are product uh, product enthusiasts, you guys might know that storytelling is being one of the keywords always being used, abused at times. Uh, so if you understand storytelling, it's more about telling the external story, thinking from the audience perspective, what other good products are, what are the benefits and how as a customer you should be feeling and like benefiting out of the product. But story building is like a step back. As a more basic, you have to make sure that uh, uh, the, the, the storytelling is based on something which is more sustainable, consistent, and aligned to your product strategy. And that comes from the product itself. And that's what the product leaders should be caring about. Uh, if done the right way, it provides the right infrastructure to inform, create, and amplify your stories. And I've, from my experience, I've seen that if you do the story building right, storytelling is almost like tenfold the impact. So that's that's what we are dealing with here. But like, why does storytelling matter, right? I mean, that's the key question here. So when you tell, when I say, say story building is important, like what is story building like, and how does it matter? So here, like say, when you understand the, the, the market, right, the product market, or like, say, especially the software, I am assuming if you guys at least will be from software SaaS world, uh, but even the normal kind of product uh, markets, you see there are like too many products out there. There are too many variations, there are too many types of companies, too many types of products solving problem for this, maybe the same customer in a different way, or like say different set, set of customers. And like say, to see uh, the world has moved to a disruption first kind of world where innovation means disruption. I mean, you have to disrupt something to actually create something out of value. And like I said, there's no, there's a myth that like, okay, we are the leaders in this in terms of product, but that's not true. Like say, anyone can come at any point of time using the latest technology and can just pull you out of the market and make sure uh, that you're out of the market and they can be the leaders there. So that's the kind of uh, market which we are dealing with. And like, if you see the product complexity also, like it has kind of grown a lot, like it has become so crude, complex nowadays. And there's a... I mean, it's been like highly differentiated nowadays that it's important to make sure whatever product you're developing, right? You have to make, make sure that it's getting uh, simplified in a sense and it's been like told to the market in a simpler way uh, in, a, in a mix of say, a few simpler pieces. But that's what, that's why like uh, story building matters. Uh, so like say when you say story building, right? And I'll come to what it is later Say there are like a few outcomes which you expect from proper story building uh, inside company. And this is like a little inward looking and it's like a, a step below, a step before uh, storytelling, I'll say. Uh, so if you see story building, there are like three main outcomes you should expect. One is like agreement with all the stakeholders involved. So it includes the marketing force, it includes the product folks, the sales, the executives, the CEOs, the CMO. Uh, or customer success it doesn't matter like anyone inside your product organization related to your product should be in agreement with what story we are trying to build. Uh, there, there is also the alignment factor where not just agreement, right? You have to be aligned to a common goal or common uh, story or like the common vision you have. So that alignment is also important so that we don't like go uh, sideways in the in the way of executing it. And uh, the third most important thing is the understanding. Uh, it's good to be in agreement, it's too good to be in alignment, but you should also understand in depth what it is, what is the story, what are we trying to tell, like what's the product and all that stuff. So understanding of the product and also the market is also very important. So these are the three outcomes you should expect out of a proper story building exercise. And like say, cracking story building is like very important. And this is like the precursor to storytelling. Effective storytelling needs to be uh, backed by story building that at least from my experience, that's what has worked. Uh, so there are like, I think I told about the uh, three outcomes, but there are like three main, I mean, if you see, right, without any of this outcome, right? So if, if there's an agreement and understanding without an alignment, right? 
it can be the case that the sales team is asking for a battle card and uh, the product team might be creating uh, a pitch deck and there may be like a lot of duplicated uh, resources in that sense if there is no alignment in that sense if there's an agreement and alignment without understanding that means whatever content we are trying to come up with to sell the product in the market it may not be like effective it may not have the depth etc the third part is like say the alignment and understanding right if if that's there uh, without the agreement i'm sure you guys have been in situations where there were a lot of wasted times discussing uh, too many things without proper agreement to the the uh, the uh, norms and the rules of the game so this is what this is why story building is so much more important than storytelling and like say uh, i mean this is one of my favorite quotes so when you take time to build your story everything that follows is more powerful more persuasive more memorable and more compelling which is like story building is what will give you tenfold storytelling that's what this quote actually means and i want to get into the basics of product positioning because story building in one sense for the product world is how you position the uh, the product itself and like say how it is relevant to the product leaders like the future product leaders like you guys so uh, there's like the product positioning problem which i have seen from my experience a lot of product leaders of product folks come and understand thing like they create product but the customers are not buying it the customers don't perceive it in the right way so you want the customers to think of the product in a certain manner but they understand it very differently so you may be creating the best enterprise grade saas solution for the world but maybe the market perceive it as it as like an average solution for smaller companies uh, so the idea is like say the product position exist on the mind of customers it's not something which is there in a word doc or in a powerpoint or something like that it exists in the mind of customers and it's our duty to make sure that is the right positioning in the mindset of the customers and we should create that reality for them uh, and it's not the job just just the role of a product marketer or like the ceo the cmo it's also the responsibility of product manager or product owner or product leader to make sure we create the right reality for uh the product which we are building and when you say reality i think everyone would have heard about the half empty half full glass uh, perception so uh the like i told the reality exists in the mind of the customers but say if you ask a customer say and you show this image of this glass or like the tumbler and ask him or her like say what's the how, what's the shape of the top part of the this glass so there may be different answers but say 70 to 80% of the people might tell it's circular in nature uh, or like say it's elliptical and all that stuff but the fact may be that it may be a rectangular or like semi rectangular kind of shape uh, you you actually have created so there's like lot of perceptions lot of uh, multiple realities or like say there may not be reality at all so there is a there is a case that like say the customers perceive something and we might be creating something which is in the vacuum and which is based on a lot of assumptions which is not based on the reality what it's there in the customer's mind so positioning as a function or as a exercise is to clear that and make sure whatever the product being developed is going to the right customers with the right benefit and they buy the product and use it to the maximum extent possible to create the best um uh, uh the best product for the world so the positioning and messaging wise i'll just go to the basics and this is like maybe too basic but uh, what is product positioning means it's a process of deciding and communicating how you want to market to think and feel about your product uh, from a product leader's perspective i'm just trying to qualify it a little more that product positioning is a strategy exercise that defines where your product or service fits in the marketplace and why it is better than all current solutions so if you see there are like a few keywords and i'm great getting into the depths of the keywords um uh, here say uh we talked about competitors we talked about alternate solutions we talked about product services strategic exercise so people used to like at least product leaders and product marketers used to do this positioning in some way and there are like a few old strategies of dealing with it uh if people from product background might know or like say if you are new to this this is something called a perceptual mapping uh which is like a traditional marketing product marketing exercise where you as a product is 
being pitched against the competitors. So you have some USPs, competitors have something else. You're trying to pitch yourself against the competition to benchmark it and maybe in the future develop products or features which kind of reinforce your positioning or like say take it to the next level or at least retain it if you are a leader. So there's something called perceptual mapping which is being quite uh, commonly used and like say some uh, product leaders have gone to the extent of value mapping it in the sense like say you create uh, a two-dimensional maybe at times like three-dimensional or a like mix of three two-dimensional graphs to make sure you the value of the product is being mapped against the competitors so we have like i mean this is just a uh, representative diagram so the idea is like your company is being pitched against competitors where does it play so there are like a few value mapping exercises also being done in the traditional sense and like say there are like a few strategies also based on whatever i just now discussed like say computer based positioning is quite straightforward that you benchmark yourself against the similar offerings and uh, come up with a new positioning uh, so the value based uh, positioning is like very much depend on quality and the price of the product and how much value it provides to the end customers and this has been one of the frameworks which is being still used now uh, quite a well uh, used framework and it kind of works quite well. The price positioning is something very unique. Like say, if you have a very cost advantage and you have, you feel the pricing is one of the key USPs of your product, then there's a way to position your product based on price. And like the leadership, leadership based positioning is like, if you are the leader in the market or in the product category, et cetera, I mean, it's easy. If you have been into this game from the starting, so it's easy to position yourself as a leader and try to beat the market in that sense. So these are like traditional position strategies being employed currently. But what I intend to say, and this comes from my own personal experience and a bit, a bit of theoretical learning from my side, is that uh, the, these are things of the past. I mean, a lot of companies have come, evolved, and have progressed in a good way based on the old strategies. But we have reached a stage of disruptive story building or disruptive product positioning exercise. And like there are like a few strategies which I will get into depths of it very soon. Uh, so the most important part of a disruptive product positioning strategy is that uh, unlike the traditional strategies, which I just now defined, uh, uh, just now explained, right? The market category is all like the product category is like quite important here. So the, your market, market category actually determines so much how your product sells. It decides whether you're the leader or another business that's going to get killed by yourself or someone else. So product that is ultra, ultra important in the disruptive world, uh, because like I told, there are too many products, too many technology, too many things happening in the market that it's difficult to framework it until unless you have proper product categories. Going to depths of product categories, right? So if you see the right side diagram, Product categories typically have two sections, where it's the structure, which is like taken from the traditional side, like where you have the structure of the competition, but there's like hierarchically placed the best or the top leaders versus the middle layer versus the low, the followers of the market, etc. And like there may be like cases where the market doesn't have a clear leader. They make too many clusters here and there, but also like say, Product categories are to be framed, not just based on competition. And that's what one of the basics part of disruptive product positioning. It should also be based on identity uh, and like from a customer identity point of view. And customers do understand some of the conventions and they do have an image of what a product category is. Like I told, positioning exists on top on the mind of customers. The same way customers also know that there are like product categories in the market. Say for instance, it may be an SUV, uh, market, it may be a hatchback uh, market, maybe like a sedan market. So these categories are there in customers' mind. At least the sophisticated buyer knows a lot of these categories himself. And that's one key consideration. And one of the biggest pop, uh, mistakes I have seen in my, from my experience is that like say, people tend to assume product categories are static and that's not the case. Like product categories are very dynamic, especially in this new world and it's prone to like very constant changes and abrupt changes. Say tomorrow you might see that one of the categories are completely gone. Say electric vehicles coming to something, uh, the scooter market may be a big abrupt change to the category all, overall. 
So likewise, so especially in the software and SaaS world, which I assume at least a few folks have exposure to, the product categories are being continuously organized by the analysts and the leaders of the market. So it's a very important, this is at the center of disruptive product positioning. Uh, and like say, what's the difference, right? Say traditional product positioning means like say you place your products into a category and you try to like define a position based on this. But what disruptive positioning means is like say you are going to pitch your product against the whole category. And how to go about it is there are different strategies to do it. I may be like just scratching the surface here, uh, but I want to keep that high level idea of how we can do it. And this is not an exhaustive list of strategies. There are like far more than what I show here, but these are like few things which I've personally used and from my own theoretical understanding of this um, exercise. So one uh, common one is like reverse positioning where you kind of position your product against the direction of the evolution of the category. And I'll try to come to a few examples and how to go about it. Uh, that's the first part of breakaway positioning is trying to like stretch the boundary of the original category and go to the next level of creating maybe an aligned category or like maybe extending the new or the original category to something more than what it is currently is. And stealth positioning is like the name indicates is maybe positioning the product to an entirely new category where it ideally may not be the right fit or like say from a common sense point of view, it may not be like a kind of a misfit, but it kind of works there. So, but note the point that we are not actually dealing with the product itself here. We are just trying to package it in a better story building or storytelling point of view so that we kind of make sure the product goes to the market with successful go to market. That's the idea of what we have. We may not be changing the product itself here in this exercise at least. Uh, so I'll go to the depths of these three strategies. So reverse positioning is, uh, say it's a, it's again one of the disruptive techniques and I've used it myself before. So uh, it's as simple as that, like say you keep the core features of the product intact and you strip away a few of the existing or like say luxury kind of features but instead of that, you kind of add other high-end features, which kind of helps you differentiate in the market. So this is predominantly used in categories where the products are like too clustered and there's like very, very, it's very difficult to actually differentiate in some sense. So you kind of use some extra reverse positioning techniques to actually make sure you have a proper positioning and you kind of have a successful go-to-market. So the best example I can give, and this is from my uh, theoretical understanding is that IKEA. So if you see IKEA and furniture industry as a domain, so furniture industry used to be like a very high sales pressure environment. Uh, it was all based on price, quality, and like say uh, a furniture uh, shop was supposed to do end to end service, including the financing, delivery, assembly. These were the norms before IKEA came into the picture. And look, what IKEA has done is like what exactly what we got reverse positioning. So it position itself against the furniture category and try to redefine the category in some form. So they kind of created a category where it's more than a furniture category where you have no sales pressure. Uh, and like the customer has to take an effort to search by finance, assemble, deliver it. It might sound counterintuitive, but it actually worked. There were quite a few or like a lot of customer segments who are ready to actually do this. Uh, effort from their point of view. And that was one of the USPs of IKEA turned it out to be. And like say, some of the extra features like guarantee for furniture and installation and like say some of the luxury wooden materials, et cetera, were taken off. And like rather they kind of added some high-end features to like reverse position themselves, like space saving designs, like lively shopping experiences, some food stalls and all that stuff. And like babysitting services, which are like high quality things uh in terms of execution and like say also they used to sell good quality furniture maybe not the highest luxury quality but good quality ones and everything in a single shop and using this what they have managed is to create a, a completely uh reverse positioned furniture world where other players were supposed to actually follow them somehow and you have seen a lot of uh d2c brands etc kind of following ikea's way especially in india and like say the second one is like breakaway positioning. Uh, in this technique, like say the product associates, associates itself from a category that is that it naturally belongs to or originally belongs to. 
Uh, they try to stress the category a little bit to new dimensions and to also change a few of the conventions of the original category. So this is predominantly seen in markets where uh, the market has kind of reached a maturity stage. There's like uh, an absolute need to somehow um, reinvent itself as a category as well as uh, from a product perspective. So the best example I can give is Swatch, where say the watch category right market was like predominantly in mature so there were not many innovations happening. Uh, there was an absolute need to get disrupted somehow. Alex Swatch just came here, came there as a fashion accessory. They they broke away from the the watch category itself and they kind of stretched it a little bit to as a fashion accessory. So they came with different colors, sizes, designs. The price was like midway price so that like it's not cheap and it's not like luxury. Uh, they also added several fashion related themes to it, uh, to the different products so that to extend and stretch the category altogether. And the promotions itself was like say new gen trendy, popular, etc., which caters to almost everyone. So that uh, the idea of breakaway position was very well executed by Swatch. And like they, you guys know what the result was, has been with Swatch already. The third one is stealth positioning and it's very straightforward in that sense. Um, say there might be a category or like a product which is being uh, there. There has been some friction from the customers or, or some other reasons where the adoption has been quite low. So the product is kind of forced to put into a different category or adapt to a different category where the customers show less resistance and like doing it little subtle way so that like say the resistance is being taken care of. The best example I can give here is from the real world is like Xbox and PlayStation. If I remember, they were first introduced as a home entertainment hub, uh, but the problem was like the needs were not felt by the customers. Technology was a little immature, so that the customer was not actually adopting it the way they expected. So what they did is like marvelous. So they kind of stealth positioned themselves against this category, but in, as a different game console uh, category. So it was done a very subtle way. They, they position themselves as a high-end game consoles uh, catered to a few use cases of young generation. And once they have adopted it, right, they started adding more use cases and more messaging around movies, music, et cetera, so that they started moving to the home entertainment hub itself. But it's like a very subtle way of positioning themselves and making sure that the product goes to the market as success. So these are like few things which I have personally uh, derived from different disruptive strategies. And let's say we can talk all GANs, but we have to know how to execute that, right? And that's like uh, the hard part of it. I think I've already talked about creating a category and like positioning the product. These are like two important parts of positioning exercise. And let's say it's, uh, it's um, predominantly executed to the four pieces of marketing. I know like if uh, people from the marketing manual will know that the four pieces of marketing and seven S's of services they are like the Bible for most of the marketing folks. From the product side, like say, product place, price, promotion, these are the four P's where you have to, I mean, there are different ways. There are like products who have catered to all the four, but there are like a few products who focus on one of the P's. So for instance, Red Bull, the case is that, say, why you see the elongated uh, bottle, like the tumbler, like the, the packaging of Red Bull is little elongated compared to the other uh, bottles, it's predominantly because they want to differentiate based on the product. Salesforce as a product is like far more advanced than many of the CRMs out there. So they have tried to uh, execute the disruption in terms of the product. Uh, if you see from a place, right, where you place the product, and this is talking from a SaaS software point of view, you see a lot of players and a lot of leaders being featured in Gartner and Forrester. And that's the easiest and the most shortcut way to be part of a product category. And it kind of gives amazing results as well with a lot of effort though. But I like price, obvious. Um, you see HubSpot was a Salesforce. HubSpot kind of uh, competes against Salesforce predominantly in the price side, even though HubSpot is one of the best products out there. But price is the key consideration for someone who wants to go against Salesforce uh, for HubSpot. And like say promotion wise, I'll say Kong is one of the very uh, closely held case study, at least for me, and they have created a category from nowhere actually, uh, using something called revenue intelligence as a keyword, and they have done a lot of good promotions uh, on top of it. That their 
the sub reposition was i mean it was learning like two to three years time and it was like a very successful exercise and I'd like congress i think everyone know where they are now they are like very good position currently so these are like a few way to be executed i'm not going to the depths of how to do it but that's uh, this is the high level understanding of how to execute that uh this is a preposition what you have in your mind uh, i'll try to like uh, just give a few real world examples from my own experiences before we close uh to the q a uh so i start with a failed positioning just to make sure the audience and product leaders should understand that positioning errors are like hard to reverse it's very very hard to reverse once you make a mistake it's very difficult to correct it and going back may be not near to impossible it is possible but it's not i mean ideally it's better to start from the scratch rather than like trying to correct the mistakes and the most uh, easy example you, i think everyone should know that tata nano is now tata thought uh, nano into the category at least maybe it's not an exercise in their uh, marketing circle but at least from their heads especially ratan data etc they thought uh, that nano is, is is in the category which is low price low quality and the messaging was already done in lot of pr and television etc is that nano is one of the cheapest car out there and like say they completely ignored the disruptive positioning uh, choice they had like say to show nano as one of the most revolutionary products in fact the product as a uh, nano product is actually very good in fact i think it won't even some accolades in terms of the best product etc but they try to reposition it uh, for the youth uh, i think they are even now coming up with electric versions but the damage was already done and i think everyone know what happened to nano as product it completely failed and it's a classical case of uh, bad messaging uh, on top of very failed positioning and i started wanted to start with this why because to understand positioning is such an important thing for all the product leaders from the starting of you create a product to the end you launch it and even after that to continuously refine the positioning also it's very important you know this exercise uh i'll try to give a few examples from my experience of reverse positioning i think i mentioned that in the highly clustered market a uh, reverse positioning kind of works uh, so inside is one of my previous companies where i was a product marketing manager uh, so it worked in a highly clustered uh, marketing platform category uh and it was very difficult to differentiate in zambao and like say we tried to do a lot but it was not very successful but then like we tried to do something disruptive and what we did it is like to reverse our positioning in terms of focusing on a few core features around growth that we realized growth is one key part of marketing uh so we tried to focus on a few features around growth and also added a few high end features around growth on top of it and we try to position uh, inside as a growth management platform and it kind of really worked and if you see inside this recently they they turned unicorn as well and the positioning predominantly remains the same even now so something reverse positioning wise has worked i just want to highlight from my experience another example again from my experience is breakaway positioning uh, i cert is was my previous company uh, so they were the leaders of customer life cycle management clm um a contract life cycle management also it's called so uh, they tried to uh, i mean they were the leaders there but there were not too many players who were like trying to copy icertus and trying to piggy back on what clm is so there was an absolute need to break away somehow and to claim higher grounds so we came up with something called contract intelligence platform uh and that has kind of worked and still work in progress but icertus is now the leader of contract intelligence platforms and this is like the best case of extending uh, existing plat uh, existing category to something more and giving more value add and also uh, taking the leadership in that category so i said this is a perfect example of breakaway positioning uh, and also stealth positioning and this is i think everyone knows slack uh, so i mean i I'm, i'm sure like there won't be anyone in the, here like who doesn't know about slack so slack if they had been uh, chosen like a messaging application category i don't i don't think like no many of us will be using it or at least knowing it at this point of time rather what they call themselves is like something called email killer and i know i mean if you see slack's evolution they have changed their positioning here and there but i think they have 
been consistently telling that they're going to kill emails and they're going to like being steadily placed in a place where they are trying to kill emails, not to just facilitate messaging. And that kind of stealth positioning uh, in a category where, I mean, maybe there was no category at all. Uh, so that kind of positioning actually helped Slack. And I think they have come down and they kind of like captured a lot of the existing messaging applications category also by coming down a bit. But this kind of stealth positioning has actually worked for Slack. Uh, so uh, this is uh, my presentation. Uh, I'm open to questions. Pangas. Yeah, thank you so much, Jyotish. Um, it was a great insight on the um, the product positioning and different frameworks over there. I do have a couple of questions coming to me on the um, uh, Q&A. Um, so I think you have given an example for uh, PlayStation and Xbox. Um, so Sriram Shira has asked that um, PlayStation and Xbox were inappropriately positioned as a home entertainment earlier. And later on, they correctly positioned the product without making any changes in the product. So is this defy a kind of um, a disruption or it just a, a positioning change uh, from where they have launched initially? Yes. So when I tell disruptive product positioning, right, it may not be actually to do with the actual product. It, the, the PlayStation as a product, say it has changed a lot maybe in the last 10, 15 years. But right. say if it was the same PlayStation 15 years back currently, right? You can actually claim to be a home entertainment hub in say 2000s, and you can still claim uh, uh, yourself was a game uh, console in 2022. That's possible. So when I tell disruptive positioning, it's more about positioning. It may not, it's may not be to do with actual product per se. So it's how to manage customers' expectations, how to make sure you have implant the right um, the positioning idea in the customer's mindset. So it may be to do less with product and features. And that's, this is an afterthought, right? Xbox and PlayStation, I'm pretty sure the product was created without uh, in a time where all these things didn't never existed, right? So it was like they want to create the best product, but it was, it fall flat. Why? Because they didn't have this disruptive text during that time. So that's yeah. what we're trying to change here. Yeah, okay. I have one more question uh, from Mihir. Um, um, I think you already gave an example for uh, Tata Nano, uh, where the positioning is different from the customer mind. Uh, do you have any more example on, on this? Um, for the failure of uh, uh, this thing, I'll have to really check. But okay. I think Tata Nano itself is... is, is one uh, yeah, it, it's one of the, the biggest case study, I believe. Yes. Um, so the yeah. figure, uh, positioning, I don't, I have best example, maybe I can go to the in-depth of what Nano is. So it's not just positioning, I'll say, it has to do with marketing, it has to do with PR, it has to do with messaging. And the messaging yeah. is a term which I didn't touch because it's little advanced. So after you have the positioning, you have to create a message around what it is, right? So right. I, uh, the product marketing folks, at least in Nano, didn't have control over that and you see Ratan data, like everyone talking about cheap cars, and these are like keywords, right? In the digital marketing world, these are like keywords. No one wants a cheap car. No one wants to have the cheapest car. No one wants to have the low quality. So cheap and low quality goes together. And this yeah, has been right. a very big failure in terms of positioning. I can, I mean, maybe can think and come up with other examples, but I think Nano is the best what we can come up with at this point of time. Yeah, that's true. Um, okay, I have one more question. Um, uh, from the marketing perspective, um, uh, what what should be the the, the disruptive marketing uh, strategies in in today's time where where things are getting done mostly into the unconventional ways uh, for almost everything in B two C and 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 B two B as well? Yeah, so the first part is like the I mean the idea of this whole plan uh, was to make sure the mindset right. We right. have to take a step back and understand disruption is not an option now. I mean it's a, it's a mandate. It's the norm. Right. Innovation nowadays means disruption. There's no innovation without disruption, at least from 2022. I mean, since the pandemic, you guys have seen it. Disruption is what innovation is. The first part is a mindset that the traditional things doesn't work. Even if it's a product management, whether it's product marketing or it's product positioning, messaging, doesn't matter. Disruption should be the first and the foremost part of everything. So the first part is a mindset. And the second part is like the strategies, right? 
whatever I share, like the three strategies is just a starting point. And there may be like 15 or 20 or maybe 100 different ways to go about it. So it's up to each and every product leader, product marketer, product manager to make sure that disruption is being factored upon in each and every uh, thing what you do. Uh, so that is the first, that's the foremost thing I feel. Okay, thank you so much. Um, maybe I, we can take a couple of more questions, I believe. We, uh, we are not running out of time. Uh, um, uh, one question is, um, um, uh, I just got it from uh, Jay Shri. Uh, where does the UPI falls? Because I think UPI has uh, came with a big swept in the last two, three years and then um, is basically leading the market uh, in terms of the FinTech and everything. A lot of things are getting driven from, from the UPI. Uh, mm -hmm. So where do you fit the UPI into this? Yeah, I mean, interesting, like say the how I got into product marketing was through UPI and <laughs> that story like in 2015, 16, when I was working in a company called uh, Childa, which was like the precursor to all the UPIs, which you guys see now. And my first assignment was to create a white paper on UPI and NPC. And, and during that, I'm sure like not even 10 or like say 0.5% uh, of the people have read about uh, UPI. Yeah, so UPI was like the perfect case of story building, right? I mean, if you see the story was built by the government or like the NPCI or Nandan Giragiri and his team. So what they have done is to take a step back, understand, okay, digital revolutions are happening. There are too many PTMs or like say chiller and all that stuff happening. Hey, how can we actually create a, a whole story for digitally enabling the world, right? I mean, at least India. Uh, so they had like Ada, they, they had some other plans. So they wanted to create a stack where payment was being done uh, instantaneously from the bank accounts. So other was there, bank account was there, it was all planned. So UPI actually automatically became the third pillar of the right it's kind of filler in that sense. So they set up NPCI. So that was a perfect example of a story building and how it translates to storytelling, right? Say, I mean, you, the B, they came up with Beam and prime minister himself came and like, I mean, kind of did a lot of marketing. About it. That's one way of storytelling, the story building, which is done which is UPI. We miss the front end or the storytelling or part of the UPI thing. Uh, then you see the, the so Paytm adopting it. Then you saw a lot of players like Google Play, like PhonePay and all these people coming and telling the story. But the story building exercise was so strong that whatever happens, right? Even if say someone else comes say, if Google shut downs today, Google Pay, they're going to shut it down. I'm sure PhonePay or Paytm or someone is going to take that initiative. And like there's the connect between the consumers and the story which was built and the infrastructure which was built. I think I did mention that story building is the infrastructure for storytelling. So the infrastructure is quite strong. So that is going to be the backbone. And that's the reason why UPI became so successful. And I think they are trying to do the same for um, e-commerce now. So if you see all the research around it, right, all the things they are trying to create the same infrastructure for uh, e-commerce. So they get, that's again a story building and like say a, uh, an institution like government with all the resources and all the money etc they can easily do that yeah um that's definitely um, um a great insight on the upis and i think whatsapp is also coming up with, with the payment gateway over there and uh, i think that is going to make a lot of changes into the rural part uh, where people are still not familiar with the, uh, with the with the wallets and they are not very confident putting things into the um, into the wallets or into the upi uh, gateways but i think whatsapp is something which they are using it constantly and may be comfortable into into the rural area specifically um, uh, Professor Sai, maybe I, I'll hand it over to you now. Um, and thank you so much, Jyotish. Uh, thank you so much for your time, uh, but, Professor uh, Sai. Jyotish, before we let you go, um, do you have a favorite question among the many questions that were asked? Yeah, um, I think the first one, right, the Xbox, um, and this thing, I think it was a little uh, deep into the topic. So that's that's good. I think the UPI question, I think like all the questions were good. I mean, I don't have any picks. Yeah, but we'll have to pick one for them to get the gift. So. <laughs> yes, yeah. you have to choose one. Okay, yeah. I'll kind of choose the first question, which was very specific to the deepest part of the presentation. So. Okay. Yeah. Pankaj, you have the name of the person? Yeah, so it's Sri Ramulu Apanna. Um, and I congratulate him uh, for uh, having the best question for the session. Thank you so much, Sri Ramlu. And you'll get your uh, gift hampers, uh, Professor Sai, I think. 
Yeah, he'll get it in an email, a coupon that he can use to, for the digital learning. And uh, congratulations again. Jyotish, thank you so much for taking your time. I know Friday evening, we all have, I'm sure you have better things to do. Uh, but, uh, you know, taking the time here, sharing your experience. Um, I really like the five ways of disruptive positioning and uh, some examples around that. Please uh, accept uh, a token of appreciation from the Institute of Product Leadership, a digital certificate uh, that is automatically verifiable on the blockchain now, and you will receive that in your inbox uh, by tomorrow. Right? And thank you so much again.